Let me start with the first paper by Padma Sharma on uh, risk shifting, regulation, and government assistance. This paper is asking how did thrifts change their behavior after 1989 when a legal change happened that made the resolution uh, process for thrifts tougher. Uh, as, as Alan Berger pointed out in the previous session, this is another one of these papers that looks for a quasi-natural experiment. Uh, and that can be a very powerful research methodology. We've seen that in many of the papers today, and this paper is another example of that. So the natural experiment is that there was a change in the law uh, that then seemed to prompt some behavior changes in the thrifts. And uh, the methodology finds that there are differences, the, the, there are differences in thrifts that can be grouped into low risk and high risk, and the model identifies that. And the results uh, plausibly show that uh, the high-risk thrifts made changes that moved their balance sheet in the direction of less risk. So just to cite one example, the paper finds that high-risk thrifts chose to hold more securities on their balance sheet and fewer loans after the policy change. And of course, remember that thrifts specialized in mortgages, so presumably moving away from mortgages uh, into securities would have been a risk-reducing change. Uh, and uh, the paper then goes on, and you didn't talk about this quite as much in your presentation, but I thought it was maybe the more interesting part of the paper to compare stock thrifts with mutual thrifts, uh, because again, there's a difference in the ownership structure, and it's not hard to think that there might be some differences in the incentives and the behavior. So I thought that was a nice, deeper look into the question of how thrifts change their behavior. And the results actually seem stronger when comparing stock thrifts with mutual thrifts. So overall, this supports the idea, the, the paper's empirical evidence supports the idea that the risk taking among thrifts that was high leading up to the thrift crisis uh, was primarily driven by moral hazard, which you know, other papers have certainly brought forward that explanation, and this paper supports that. And then the change in behavior once the law was changed to limit the scope of uh, bailouts, then you saw the change in risk-taking behavior towards lower risk. I, I did, uh, of course, think of an alternative hypothesis uh, to possibly explain this change in behavior, which was simply that as the thrift crisis evolved in the 80s and then sort of reached uh, a pretty dramatic peak, that thrifts uh, everywhere sort of realized that the game was up and that it was really time to de-risk uh, maybe just broadly across the industry and uh, that this was a time to maybe be in survival mode rather than risk-taking mode. And so maybe the change in the law that happened in 1989, uh, maybe that was not the driving factor. Maybe it was just the course of, of uh, the thrift crisis itself. I think this highlights one of the challenges with the quasi-natural experiment methodology is that you can't hold everything else constant and maybe there were other things going on uh, that could explain the shift into safer balance sheets. Uh, the second paper by Stefan Llewellyn uh, looks back at the deregulation of interstate banking. Uh, this, is, this topic of the dereg deregulation of interstate banking uh, restrictions has actually come up a few times already at the conference. Governor Bowman mentioned it in her remarks. Uh, so it's interesting that you've gone back and looked into uh, an episode that actually happened quite some time ago, but you have, new, you have a new way of looking at it and new evidence. Uh, and the, the new way of looking at it is to construct a more sophisticated measure of how and when the deregulation of interstate banking restrictions happened. Uh, you're actually t tackling a really tough job in uh, academic literature, which is you're trying to overturn the conventional wisdom and uh, uh, on something that's been studied a lot. I tried to think of what's a good analogy for that, uh, and the best example I could think of was, uh, this is a medical example, is that we used to think that ulcers were caused by people being nervous and drinking a lot of coffee, uh, and then later we learned from some clever researchers that ulcers are actually caused by bacteria. And uh, that then prompted a big change in how you treat ulcers. Uh, that was a big paradigm shift. You, you have a tough job, but I found your paper to be convincing. So uh, at least I uh, 
would support that, that paradigm shift. The paper does find that when you take into account the different way of measuring deregulation and the timing of deregulation across states, you do find that competition increases, net interest margins go down, uh, mergers and acquisitions go up, bank profitability goes down, risk taking goes up. Uh, and as, as you explained, that's, that's a very consistent story with how uh, deregulation has played out in other markets. My comment is that you know, economists usually argue that competition uh, and this sort of deregulation can be welfare enhancing. That's the typical economist view. And, and your paper highlighted that, uh, for example, consumers were getting higher rates on their deposits, uh, which certainly would be good for consumers. Um, you also showed that deregul this deregulation of interstate banking led to consolidation and fewer community banks. That made me think about something that's not in your model, but uh, was also mentioned by Governor Bowman in her remarks this morning, which is that community banks provide a lot of benefits across the community that maybe don't show up in the typical uh, kind of economic model, but uh, the benefits in terms of serving the community, leadership in the community, uh, uh, and uh, just providing that presence to support the local community uh, as we've heard about, you know, throughout this conference. So, you know, where is the balance between uh, the benefits of competition versus the benefits of the community banking model? Your paper, you know, really brought that comment home to me. Uh, then the third paper uh, is about reliance on third-party verification in bank supervision. Uh, it's another quasi-natural experiment paper. So uh, you've highlighted a change in the law uh, that meant that community banks with between $500 million and $1 billion in assets uh, no longer had to have an external uh, audit verification and had worse outcomes along dimensions like more loan charge-offs, more rating downgrades. Uh, so this was an interesting and surprising fact. I didn't, I didn't know this, but you're, you had charts uh, in your paper that showed that when you separate out banks below 500 million and community banks above 500 million but less than 1 billion, that there actually was a difference in performance towards the end of your sample period. Uh, now, you, you had controls for a, a lot of things, which of course is a good research practice. But again, I, uh, my, my comment or my question is, comes back to this issue of the quasi-natural experiment because you know, the timing of the effects that you're looking at, uh, your, your law change happened in, in 2005. The effects started to show up in years four and five after the change, which was 2009, 2010, and there was something else going on then. Uh, there was the financial crisis, big increase in uh, non-performing loans, bank failures at community banks. So uh, to me, that's a, gonna be a challenge to separate out the change in the law in 2005 about the external auditor versus all the impacts of the financial crisis of the financial crisis so i confess that i'm just wondering how much of the results are being driven by the financial crisis uh, versus some of the effects you cited um, it's it's certainly plausible that uh, banks no longer having external audits could be taking more risks, but the smaller banks already had no external audit requirement. Uh, yet you find your, your results show that the smaller banks did better in the crisis. One uh, control variable that I would have been interested to see is commercial real estate exposure. That was a big driver of a lot of bank failures in the crisis. Uh, and maybe, that, maybe there's something there that could help you disentangle uh, these effects. <clears throat> I also wondered if the gap between the two groups might close up if you extended, you, you stopped your data in 2010, but we certainly know that community, the stress in the community banking system continued well into 2011, 12, 13, uh, with still a lot of bank failures. So I wonder if you extended the data, maybe the gap would close or maybe you'd be able to identify um, better. Uh, and. Uh, I, I just wanted to add one more comment that goes beyond a little bit the three papers in the session, but with respect to the third paper, I did want to highlight the fact that you are using confidential data on supervisory ratings in your research, which I think is a good innovation. We're seeing more papers in economics that do that. 
Uh, and there's a growing literature that looks at uh, the effects of bank supervision on a broad range of indicators of banking. And I just wanted to briefly touch on uh, what some of the findings from that literature have been. So this is you know, beyond the three papers that we've seen here, but since the topic of the session is how banks respond to changes in regulation or supervision, uh, I just wanted to offer a couple comments. The first, uh, I, I guess the, the main point is that there have been a number of papers recently that have used uh, data like uh, confidential supervisory ratings or number of hours spent on exams that have found that more supervisory attention can, uh, has empirically been shown to have positive effects on safety and soundness. Uh, and uh, we have some, there are some identification strategies that economists have used related to exam frequency or supervisory hours to find that more supervisory attention results in reduced risk taking, more conservative loss reviews, uh, a decreased chance of failure. Uh, one of these papers exploited the difference in the distance between the bank's office and the supervisor's office and actually found that that had an impact as well. Uh, and I'd just like to encourage all the researchers out there to, to keep pushing ahead on the line of research that not only these three papers, but other papers have tackled, uh, relying on uh, the impact of supervision and regulation, uh, because I think we still have a lot to learn. Uh, so that concludes my comments.